Hey everybody, Norm over here, and I've got my friend from Twisted Sister, J.J. French over here, playing this beautiful Murphy Lab, Les Paul. And, uh, you know, we've been talking about a lot of stuff. Uh, I don't know if you're all aware of the pink guitar setup that you did. It was great. The Pink Burst Project, right? Pink Burst Project, that was a charity thing. Um, uh, explain it. So I got uh, 24, 25 guitar and amplifier manufacturers to all agree to a color motif that's never been done before, probably never be done again, although you did uh, mention the, the blue project that was done for the Chinnery collection. Yeah, this Scott was Chinnery. Right, for Scott Chinnery, and this maybe is the only other collection that was ever done like this. And I was able to convince these guitar companies to uh, take my Les Paul, which was painted pink by a guy named Steve Carr, not the Steve Carr that makes amplifiers, but a guy who was actually a luthier in Long Island who made the KISS first axe basses. Uh -huh. He, uh, I met him in Long Island in 1976, and I said to him, you know, can you take this tobacco burst Norland era Les Paul that weighed a thousand freaking pounds because they're boat anchors, remember? Yeah, the yeah, Norland yeah, era yeah. Les Pauls, right? The ones that give us all neck problems and back problems. I know all about it. And I said, can you make it pink? And he made it pink for me. And I will tell you a quick story about it because actually this is interesting. Okay. So the day that that guitar was delivered to me was at a nightclub in Long Island called the Mad Hatter. And Steve Carr had some 17 year old kid who was working for him and he told the kid, deliver JJ this guitar to this club. And the kid comes to the club back door, says I got your guitar, go out to the parking lot. So I go in the parking lot with him and he pulls out the guitar, it's newly painted pink, it's really beautiful. And by the way, if you read Vintage Guitar Magazine and you have this issue of Vintage Guitar, which is this, which I believe is June. The latest, yeah. The latest issue with Marty Friedman on the cover, they do a story on the guitars of Stay Hungry because it's the 40th anniversary of the release of the album Stay Hungry. Another story. Anyway, I, I, I told him, hold the guitar up. Now, remember, this kid's 17, right? Uh -huh. He's meeting me for the first time. And, the, and I said, hold the guitar up. Now, remember The Godfather? when uh, Michael is acting like he's a the mob guy protecting his dad in the hospital and yeah. McCluskey comes and they go hold him up and he punches he punches my, uh, Al Pacino's character in the face so I say to the kid hold the guitar up and the kid holds the guitar but remember it's newly painted I said hold it and he goes okay he's holding it and I take I had a big ring on and I punch the guitar and put a big crack in the bottom of it and the kid goes whoa whoa what did you just, what did you just do <laughs> and I said let me tell you something I'm gonna walk out on stage in an hour, and my singer more than likely is gonna do that to my guitar with a mic stand. So before, anyhow, you might, I might so as well be the may first one. Well be the first one to do it. So here's the irony of life. Many, many years later, I do this Pink Burst project, and I'm trying to convince other guitar companies to make their guitars that same color, mm -hmm. put trapezoid inlays, trying to go to go to a Fender, I went to the Fender booth at NAMM, tell John Cruz, I want you to make a Fender look like a Gibson. He said, what do you mean? I want you to put trapezoid inlays, I want you to put binding, and I want you to match this color. And John Cruz looks at me and he goes, you want me to make a Stratocaster and a Telecaster look like a Les Paul? And just at that moment, and I swear to you, I swear this is a true story. At that very moment that I'm telling John Cruz, who I'd never met in my life, yeah. that story to try to convince him because if I couldn't get Fender to agree, I'm not getting anybody to agree, right? Yeah. right? You gotta start with I gotta start with the Fender. Three, three, uh, gotta go on. Gibson's already, you know, they're already had agreed, but I needed to get Fender. At that absolute moment, Norm, and I'm not a religious guy, and I don't know why this happened, but the kid who delivered me that guitar in 1977 was walking by me and John <laughs> Cruz, and he stops and he goes, you're J.J. French, right? He goes, I work for Steve Carr in 1977. I brought you that guitar, and I looked, and John Cruz thought it was a setup. Thought the whole thing was yeah, BS. Yeah. And I said to the kid, if you're the kid that brought me the car, what did I do? And he said, man, you told me to hold the guitar up and you punched a freaking gash in that guitar. And John Cruz said, dude, I'm in. Whatever you want to do. Whatever you want to do. So he did it. And then once he did it, Martin saw it and Martin did it. And then so on and so on and so forth. Car. So anyway, that's how that got uh, created. And I've been in this guitar business for, you know, basically since I was 14 years old, buying and selling guitars. You're what, 30 now? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 30 plus 30 plus 30 yeah, plus 30 plus. I get it. Uh, yeah. that's no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be 72 and Twisted Sister. I'm celebrating its 52nd year of existence this year, which is crazy. Because I don't think if you ask anybody in, and we all started the same year, um, uh, ACDC, KISS, Judas Priest, Aerosmith, Twisted all started in 73. Uh -huh. I think if you asked any of us in 73 how long we'd last, we would have said five years. Sure. Right? Fact, maybe. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. I don't know, but not 50. Yeah. 
Nothing and you too. were saying that uh, the record is uh, the Stay most, Hungry. Uh, yeah. Oh, we're not going to take it, and I want to rock in the most licensed songs in the history of heavy metal right now. More TV shows, more, more soundtracks, more, more commercials. It's always in commercials. People hear it all the time. There is no way in, in 84, when the album came out, that we could have predicted the longevity of those songs and here we are 40 years later and this is the reason why I can still afford to <laughs> come to music stores by the way. He's uh, a nice guy and a victim and uh, a, 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 new, victim. A, a, new yes. victim. I, I just want to tell you one story since you were talking about the pink guitars because yeah. this is uh, one of my first experiences with Sunburst Les Pauls and stuff okay. like that. So in Miami I, where I grew up there was a repair guy named G.L. Styles, and he was kind of like this kind of a country guy, and he would do all the guitar repairs and everybody, he was the guy in Miami. And there was a guy that had a 59 burst that had a top like this, like really great flame, and the guy was going to a gig. And it was a 59. It, so was, it was a the, real, was 59. real deal. Now, this is like real the deal. year of this is like maybe 1968. Oh, okay. So there was no reissues. Yeah, of course. No, it was, it was a, real deal. a real deal. And so he's going to a gig and he puts the guitar in the case behind the car, behind the back wheel, forgets it's there and runs over the guitar. And he broke the neck on the guitar right. and he brought it to JL Styles to fix the guitar. And Styles ended up doing it in a pink burst. You're kidding. Now, somewhere around, unless somebody has wow. refinished wow. that guitar, wow. and it looked great, and it had a top of doom for a, 50, a real 59, so the pink right. burst looked so cool on that guitar. Wow. Somewhere, there's a real 59 with a pink burst with a killer top. So wait, they managed to make it translucent enough so you could see mm -hmm. the top. Oh yeah, absolutely. Wow. It was a pink burst. Wow, interesting. Because when he did a beautiful job on it. I mean, I I didn't know anything about those guitars at right. that time, but I saw the guitar in his shop after it was done, after he refinished it, and I'm like, what's that? And I didn't know what a burst was in 1968. This is before I started buying and selling guitars. Yeah, and here we are. Was, here. I think I was maybe one or two guitars into buying and selling guitars, right. and people said, well, you don't know what that is. That's a 59, 59. Sunburst Les Paul, and at the time, if they were in great shape, they were 800 bucks. Uh, in that year, absolutely, they were. And yes. people were crying, bitching, and moaning, 800 bucks for a guitar. Who would spend 800 bucks for a guitar? Yeah. And think about it, when the guitar came out in 59, it was $252, and the case was like 50 bucks, something like right. that, right? And yet the guitar was considered the 58, 59, 60s to be a failure. They right. made maybe 1600 total. Not to mention the Karina right. stuff, which was a failure too. Which was a failure too, right? The V and the Explorer. You could have bought that yeah. stuff for next to nothing. Nothing. And now they're worth a fortune. And you know, the average, you know, the Sunburst taking away a, pers a, a famous person owning it. Just a really good condition 59 is $350,000 to $400,000. Right? And maybe more. I know there's somebody that is asking a million now. I don't know if they're on acid or what the deal is. Some, well, some heavy hallucinogen. Yeah, but you ask whatever you ask. You don't either you sell it or you don't sell it. So listen, I, I, when I first noticed a 59 burst on 48th Street, mm -hmm. was in 1972. I was walking down 48th Street one day and they had a 59 burst in We Buy. Yeah, and the price was fifteen hundred bucks, Richie Friedman. Yeah, and it was fifteen hundred dollars. And back then, you know, you bought your uh, Gibson SGs for like three hundred, four hundred dollars, and you know, Telecasters five, six, whatever. Um, uh, and I remember thinking fifteen hundred bucks. Now I'd already seen Clapton play on the Blues Breakers record, and I saw yeah. Mike Bloomfield play it on the Super Session record. Right. In fact, Mike Bloomfield's cover on Super Session was the first cover with a fifty-nine burst, if I'm not mistaken. And Bloomfield really made everybody want to buy one yeah. of those guitars. Yeah, and I was down to Danny Armstrong, on I knew that, uh, right yeah. down on LaGuardia Place, and he had a couple of gold tops. He had he uh, because the gold tops got traded in. For the burst. the burst, John Sebastian told me the whole story that yeah, he told I, Mike I've Bloomfield. I've seen John's and played John's, and John's a really good guy. Really good too. guy, and he has the whole great story. But it was always more money than I had. You know, I could never quite have it. It was always dangling the carrot in front of me. I couldn't afford it. And then one day, so here's how the prices went. So in '68 it was like 800 bucks. Mm -hmm. By '72 it was 1,500 dollars. Yep. By '80, '79, '80, they were only around three grand. 
That's all it was. It wasn't until 84 when the, the craziness started because uh, someone in Hawaii paid 10 grand for one. I think we all looked at it and said, that'll never happen again. Right. But one day, Joe Calzone from Calzone Case Company comes into a sound check of Twisted Sister and we're playing Connecticut in Westport next to the Calzone factory. And I knew Calzone. Joe comes in and he brings a 59 burst in in a case and he goes, JJ, you want a 59 burst? And I went, Hell yeah, how much? He goes, 3,000 bucks. And he, he pulls it out, remember it's 1980, he pulls it out and he hands it to me at Soundcheck and I go up on stage and we're, we're doing Breaking the Law by Judas Priest and D comes down with a mic stand. I swear he misses it by a quarter of an inch and I went, ha, ah, ah, ha, get it out of here. Just get it out of here because I couldn't afford the 3,000 and I yeah. didn't buy it. And that was the closest I came. And years later I said to Joe, do you remember coming down? He goes, oh yeah. He goes, some band couldn't afford to pay me a bill and I took all their gear and I just took the, the just that day I took their guitars from them and I came in and I offered it to you and I missed the damn one. But here we are with reissues and let's talk about these reissues. They're really great reissues. They're fantastic. They're building some of the best stuff that they've built in yeah. 50, 60 years. Yeah. Really, I mean, unless you're talking about a real one, and these guitars just play, they're ready to go. They I mean, do. they sound, they play, this top, the finish, all that. Um, I have a, a buddy of mine who was the manager of my store who now works for Gibson. I think he has a lot to do with some of the stuff, and my friend Matt, over there, also in the custom shop, right? Uh, and also Tom Murphy, who is an old buddy of mine. These guys have really put a lot of effort into trying to get it right. So um, this These, Murphy lab, yeah. I, I mean, they're killer. They feel great. <laughs> the neck feels great. The tone feels great. It's just this just happens to be unfortunately too good for me to like have to pass up because I really did not come here intending to do anything more than just sit around tell a story or two, meet you. It's your wife's birthday. And that's too, my wife's birthday is in two guitar. days, which like, I can't, you know, it's just gonna kill We won't air here. this. Well, maybe he probably doesn't watch our videos. But if he does, you know, you yeah. can you can come in and join me in my doghouse, because I'm in the doghouse <laughs> most of the time. Sweetheart, look what I got for you for your birthday. Don't you want to make me happy on your birthday? Learn how to play it. <laughs> and let me play it when you're not. Anyway, the store is beautiful. I had heard thank about you. it for years. Read about it in Vintage Guitar Magazine, who's got to have to thank Vintage Guitar for doing a million stories on I me. Mean, do you, by the way, re know Tone Quest Magazine? Do you ever read Tone I, Quest? I don't really read it, but I, I, I'm aware. I have seen it, and I have read it, but I mean, yeah. I, not on a regular basis. So they are just, they just became um, an advertiser of my podcast. Oh, great. Tone Quest Magazine and DiMarzio, because Larry DiMarzio and I go back. I, I probably had the very first uh, Super Distortions in my Pink Les Paul back in 77, I believe that's when they really? came out, 76, 77. Now, mm -hmm. you know Bill Lawrence, obviously. Of course, yeah. So Bill Lawrence, I had Bill Lawrence. This is phone. old guys talking, you know, yeah. like, you know, w about other old guys. These are vintage guys talking about vintage guys, talking about vintage guitars. But Bill Lawrence, in the, in the realm of gu guitar pickups, worked for Danny Armstrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, he left Danny, and he opened up his own store. So in 1972, I had a, a, a junior that I bought from a junkie in Central Park in 1970 for like 50, 50 bucks. I, I'll say it, right? His kid, Tommy Stroy was killed, unfortunately, he died years ago. But he was walking through the park one day, May 1st, 1970. Why do I know the date? Because I made him sign a receipt in case it was a stolen guitar and the police came to me. I could say, I bought it from this guy. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I had a junior, and um, I because I couldn't afford a burst or anything else anyway. And I brought it to Bill Lawrence. I said, Bill. I said, this is the first guitar I ever screwed up. And you know how, you know the story, if you're around long enough, you've screwed up a guitar. Oh, you've yeah. done uh, stupid things to I a guitar. I can tell you a few things, you know, I've done a few. Uh, done. So what I do is I handed him the junior. And I said, what do you got? Can you make a humbucking? And he goes, you know, I'm making my custom made humbuckings, but they're on big steel plates with bigger, Allen yeah. screws. And he goes, now I'll have to like, I'll have to dig. So he dug holes in the junior. He dug two holes. He stuck these things in there. He ripped off the, the pick guard, he put little toggle switches in to, to split the coils, because he was in the split coils back mm -hmm. in 1970. Yeah. And so for a couple of years, I played a completely destroyed junior um, until I bought my first gold top at Music Inn, which is a 53 gold top with a Bigsby, and I paid 400 bucks and I traded in a black uh, Les Paul Custom for the gold top. And of course I screwed that up. I screwed that one up because I put humbuckings in that one. So we all have stories of those. Oh, now yeah. these days, well, you, you don't touch them. anything. I did. I, I remember when I first got my the first Paisley Telly I ever got. 
you know, the contact paper was slightly peeling a little bit. Yeah. So I went, yeah, who the hell would want a Paisley? And I peeled it off and I had a friend of mine refinish it in Nashville. So what can I tell you? You peeled the Paisley off of the pink, the, the Fender, mm -hmm. you know, yes. the 68, yep. which today is worth how much? A lot oh. more money than I'd like to think of, you know, so. I mean, the, the paper, it, you know, it's like a contact paper thing, and it was just kind of peeling up a bit. And I figured, ah, who, who'd want to be seen playing the Paisley? Of course, James Burton, but, uh, but anyhow, we all do some dumb stuff, so. Yeah. Uh, but here's this beautiful store, and, and, and run by people who know what they're talking about. And that's really what's, uh, what's really cool about it. You good yeah. products, and, and uh, the right people know that this is where you go to get the really good stuff and you stay well, away you. from the big box stores because you know they're just they they are what they are the big box stores are what they are uh, what i have enough trouble controlling one store yeah. besides a whole but not just that though it, don't you find it weird young because younger people think that you just just buy it in mail order they don't understand you need to come and feel these things like it's really important i really think that you know being able to hold the guitar feel the shape of the neck here with the pickup sound like if it's an electric um, it's a it's a big thing, you know. So the truth of the matter is, and I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to just close with this. Ninety-five percent of it is the player, but a player with a great instrument, that's a great combination. That's right? a great combination, right? Don't ever think that the pedal or the guitar that you're buying, it, it, because you're emulating your your hero, which is an important thing. We all do. We all the reason why we buy the guitars we buy is because our heroes play those guitars. Right. But at the end of the day, if it's not here, it's not anywhere. And by the way, Jimi Hendrix would sound like Jimi Hendrix on a nylon string guitar. That's right. Leslie West would sound like Leslie West on a nylon string guitar. Santana Absolutely. would sound like Santana, and BB King would sound like BB King. So as a music here. store owner, that's probably a dumb thing for me to say, but it's true. But again, the right instrument in the hands of the right player. And but no, no, you have you know why? Because the incentive to play more on an instrument that you love is the key to getting it makes better. Makes you practice. Makes you practice, and so that's why. While it has to be here, it's all in the inspiration you get from the instrument too. So it's a double. It's it's both sides of things. Well, JJ has a podcast. You'll have to check out JJ's podcast. Yeah, it's podcast. called the JJ French Connection, Beyond the Music. It's on Apple. It's on Spotify. I have a lot of different people on there, but mostly I have like nine, I think I have nine or ten guitar players at this point, right? We've got Joel Hookstra. We have uh, Nuno Betancourt. We've had Joe Bonamassa. We've had... Um, Joe who? <laughs> yeah, you kind of know him. Tom, we've had Tommy Emmanuel. Uh, hey, we have right. Ricky Medlock from Leonard Skinner this week. I mean, great players. Uh, uh, Steve Lukather. Amazing players, great Absolutely. players, um, who give the inside tips as to how they they became the players that they are. Uh, amongst many, there's authors and there's authors, there's directors and all that. So check out the podcast. Also, I have a book called Twisted Business because I also managed Twisted Sister for 45 of those years. It's available on Amazon, and Twisted Business gives you the inside story on how Twisted Sister became truly became successful by using business approaches. It wasn't sex, drugs, and rock and roll, believe it or not. Although that's the really? fantasy we all like to talk about. Yeah. It is not, and it's that. And also, I do motivation speaking and keynote speeches and you can all find that on jjfrench.com j-a-y-j-a-y.com jjfrench.com you can find all that information there and thank you so much for uh, hosting all me, right man. buddy it's thank great. you and you know just because we've been blabbing how about taking us out playing us a little song <laughs> guys I really appreciate it nice having another fellow geezer uh, that we can talk old times with and all that <laughs> thanks, thanks JJ way to go buddy